Hello and welcome everybody to another Thursday afternoon program with the Genealogy Center. I am very excited for our speaker today, Colin Whitney, where he will be talking about the new California Pioneer Certificate Program. Colin Whitney, he was born and raised outside of London. Uh, he immigrated to the United States in 1962 and he studied physics at MIT and he got his doctorate in 1970. So in the late 70s, he moved to California. He joined the Hughes Aircraft Company in Culver City, and he retired from Hughes in 1999 as the technical director at their missile systems group in Arizona. So he had started doing genealogy back in 2009 when he discovered his step-grandfather's files relating to a DAR application uh, and rudiments of a family tree. So he got interested. And then he became even more interested when he moved back to California in 2018. Uh, he became involved with the San Diego Genealogical Society as the education director, and he currently leads their California Pioneer Certificate Program, which is what he is going to talk to us about today. So I see it is now 6.30, so I'm going to disappear and let Colin get started. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about the San Diego Genealogical Society's California Pioneer Certificate Program. It's a new program for us, and we're very excited about it. And um, we're in about uh, the third year since it uh, started, and we're in a phase where we're trying to go out and uh, figure out how we let people know that this resource is available and this program is available. So coming to talk to you, um, I encourage you to spread the word to anybody who has uh, deep roots in, in uh, California as you learn a little bit more about this program. <clears throat> well, we're not only gonna talk about the program, we will be talking about the early history of California and its records because uh, as you know, when you're searching a location, you really need to know something about the history so that you need so that you can find out which records you might be looking for that pertain to your <clears throat> ancestor. Well, first a word about the San Diego Genealogical Society. We are California based and our home is San Diego. And it's fortunately not not as hot as some places in the country right now. It was founded 77 years ago, so we've been around for a little while. And our mission, like uh, most genealogical societies, that is to help people research their family history. Uh, to do that, we provide monthly meetings with nationally recognized uh, speakers who uh, talk to us about a broad range of subjects. We also have our own educational program of special interest groups, which meet throughout the month, and two classes that we hold uh, throughout the month uh, as well. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, we have recently developed this new lineage program, which we call the California Pioneer Certificate Program. And uh, its purpose is to honor the early settlers of California and four key events in the state's history. Those events are California's admission to statehood, the gold rush, the iconic California missions, and the disastrous San Francisco earthquake, which had a big impact on the state. Now, for me, uh, when I was in school, I was really not much interested in history, but I find that genealogy really makes history become personal to me so that I can uh, really get a connection to what was going on in the historical events. And we're hoping that this program will help ke keep the uh, early California pioneer memories alive because uh, uh, they live on in their descendants. Now, what the program does is it will certify an applicant's descent from an eligible pioneer. <clears throat> to be eligible, the pioneer uh, has, could be either a resident uh, in the current bounds of California prior to 1850, 
he could be or she could be a person living in one of the historic gold rush counters between 1848 and 1860. And on our website, we have which counters there are, and you'll see in a little bit a map to show where the locations of those historic counters are. Or they could uh, be a resident of San Francisco County during the earthquake of 1906, or perhaps be recorded in one of the records of the iconic California missions. In order to assist people in finding their California pioneer, we have developed, or I should more accurately say, we are developing a searchable database. We're adding to it all the time. We would like to make it a one-stop shop. Uh, we're not there yet, but we do have over 410,000 vetted pioneer records. So if you find your name there, you will know that they are eligible for the program. You can find out about the lives of more than 3,000 of these California pioneers because we have their biographies and we have numerous other genealogical and historical resources. And we have finding aids that uh, will assist you in your research. Now a successful applicant uh, receives both a certificate and a lineage chart. These were designed by one of the committee members. And you can see on the left-hand side, the certificate uh, says it's for a California pioneer. Since we have four categories, that wording will change a little bit to reflect the particular category of pioneer, but they all look uh, fairly much the same. <clears throat> and on the right, you will see the descendants uh, chart uh, from the pioneer or the pioneer couple down to the applicant. And in the background, you'll see uh, uh, scenes which uh, represent the time frame that we're talking about. <clears throat> when you go to our website, you will see a symbolic digital auto wall, which is constructed of bricks that would have been uh, available uh, at that time period. And on each brick, we have the name of a California pioneer. In the center, we have a carousel, which rotates to show pictures of California pioneers, pictures of missions, um, <clears throat> pictures of the gold rush, uh, various scenes that would be typical of the time we're, we're talking about. Below the carousel, <clears throat> there are six entry portals. The one on the bottom left is the portal that you would enter to apply for the program and we have instructions there on what is required and how to do it. Above that is the portal where you can access the California Pioneer biographies <clears throat> and the other four portals are the portals that you would enter depending on the kind of pioneer that uh, you were looking for whether it was a gold rush pioneer, a resident before 1850, a mission pioneer, or an earthquake pioneer. So that's a little bit about the program. We'll talk now um, about the history and the records, and then we'll come back to the program at the end here. I've captured on this slide here some of the key dates and events uh, in California's history. It has been a fairly short recorded history compared to that uh, in uh, Europe, but it has been a rich and dynamic one. However, it was first uh, continuously inhabited about 15,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand years, when humans came from Asia across the Beringia land, land bridge uh, at the end of the Ice Age. And this is earlier than some of the parts of Europe, particularly in Northern Europe. However, the recorded history really starts in 1542 when Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo sailed up the coast of uh, California and saw California and started recording what he saw. <clears throat> there were numerous uh, other expeditions 
up to uh, California. Uh, however, um, Spain that was claiming the land at that time lost interest in uh, colonizing uh, California until almost 250 years later when Gaspar de Patola led the first uh, colonizing expedition to California and ended up in uh, San Diego. Now, in 1821, the uh, rulership of California uh, changed from Spain to Mexico. Um, in 1821, the Mexicans won independence from Spain. And from then on, it was a uh, control by, by Spain. And the period from 1769 up until 1848, you'll often see called the uh, period of uh, um, colonization of um, colonial California. Fairly shortly after Mexico won independence, uh, the American War broke out, lasted two years, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. It was culminated in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ceded California and uh, much of the southwest of what we know as the United States uh, today. Uh, they ceded that to the United States. <clears throat> About the same time, the gold rush started, and uh, that had such an enormous impact on the state with literally hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the world, that uh, by 1850, it was able to become the 35th state within the United States. <clears throat> and then in 1906, we have the deadliest US natural disaster, the San Francisco earthquake. So to show you what we were talking about, on the left you see a uh, map of Mexico as it was in 1835. It stretched from the Yucatan Peninsula up to Oregon and out into much of the southwestern United States. The peninsula you see there is uh, Baja California, sometimes it's broken up into uh, Baja California Norte and Baja California Sur. And you'll see that as you look at the records and uh, the history of the time. So the question is why did Spain uh, initially occupy California? Well, the short answer is that it, there, the fact that they conquered Mexico, gave them access both to the Pacific and uh, to California. Europeans first came to the Americas uh, uh, in 1021, carbon dating tells us that the Vikings uh, visited Newfoundland and they stayed for a while and they left and nobody quite knows uh, why. Couldn't, couldn't be because it was too cold because they lived in Greenland and Iceland. Um, so nobody knows quite why they left. <clears throat> but the person who really started the European exploration of the America was Christopher Columbus, almost uh, 500 years after the Vikings. And he was an Italian, and he landed in the Bahamas, and he visited Cuba and uh, Hispaniola, uh, which is uh, the Dominican Republic and uh, Haiti today. Then in 1504, Hernan Cortes, a Spaniard, sailed to the New World, entired, inspired by tales of gold that he'd heard from people coming back from the Americas. And he came out to uh, America. And in 1506, he fought in the conquest of Hispaniola and Cuba. Remember, Bahamas, Cuba, and Hispaniola, of course, are islands off the coast. They weren't on the mainland of um, the Americas yet. And it wasn't until 1519 that Cortes landed on the Yucatan Peninsula with 11 ships and 500 men, and he claimed the land for Spain. However, the Aztecs were ruling uh, 
Mexico at the time, they had the Aztec Empire. He had to defeat the At Aztecs. He overthrew them in 1521, and he governed Mexico until 1524. And the fact that Spain um, occupied and owned uh, Mexico at that time gave them access to the Pacific and to California and to trade with Asia. And that was a big deal at that time. And we'll come to that in a second. Now, uh, Juan Rodrigo Cabrillo was really the first European to reach Alta California. Alta California is the upper left-hand corner in that map that I showed you of, uh, of Mexico. And he sailed up the coast and um, sighted California and was looking to see what riches uh, California might hold and uh, was it suitable for colonizing and so on. He had fought with Hernan Cortez in Mexico and was commissioned by the Viceroy of New Spain, which is what uh, the land was called at that point, Antonio de Mendoza. And he was charged with uh, exploring this Pacific coast and also finding an alternate shorter route, trade route with the Far East. The trade between Europe and Asia was lucrative with, um, in, in gold and spices. But from Europe, of course, you had to go around Africa and that was a long arduous and dangerous journeys. So all the European superpowers were looking for a pathway to the West uh, between Europe and Asia. And of course, America was in the way, um, except the Spanish found that little narrow area in Central America, uh, Mexico, so that they could cross that and they could uh, uh, trade more easily with Asia than the other European uh, powers. Cabrillo in 1542 sailed from Navidad to San Diego and unfortunately died on the vo voyage, but his crew recorded the first accounts of the west coast of Alta California. That's the area above Baja California. They mapped the coast. Uh, they looked for habitable land and recommended Monterey as a place and uh, ended up being the capital of California. And they were looking for safe harbors uh, for the uh, trading, uh, uh, to protect the trade and also uh, for future explorers. However, they sailed up uh, California and they missed San Francisco Bay. One of the important uh, outcomes of this particular uh, voyage of exploration was that uh, they were able to map the coast of California. They were able to find habitable places and make recommendation uh, for future settlement and future ex explorers. Another ex explorer was Viz uh, Sebastian Vizcaino, who was a, a Spaniard who in the early 50s uh, fought for the Spanish invasion of Portugal. And he arrived in New Spain in 1583. And uh, he was a merchant. He uh, uh, engaged in the lucrative trades with Asia, which had started about 20 years earlier and by 1565. Because of his knowledge, he was commissioned in 1601 by the Spanish Viceroy, uh, as uh, Cabrillo was, to find safe harbors in Alta California, but also to protect the Spanish ships. By this time, the English raiders, particularly Sir Francis Drake and Sir Thomas Cavendish, were uh, plundering the Spanish galleons, which were coming home from Asia laden with uh, gold and spices. And uh, the Spanish needed to protect that. So they needed to find those uh, safe harbors. So in 1602, he sailed to San Diego 
up from Mexico. He mapped the coast up to Monterey, found no safe harbor. And then he was forced to return. But uh, one ship did sail up to Oregon and again miss San Francisco. So now that was uh, 1602. Now we come to the 1700s. And this is when Spain is starting to think that they really need to start settling California. So they called upon Gaspar de Potola, who was a military officer born in 1716 in uh, Catalonia, Spain. He had fought with the Spanish in both Italy and, and Spain. And he was appointed the first governor of Las Colafordias, with an S, which included Alta California, Baja, and Baja Sur. In 1769, he was commissioned by King Charles III of Spain, not England, uh, to secure the Spanish claim to Alta California. Now the Spanish were concerned because the Russians were advancing from the north, the British from Canada, and they wanted to secure uh, California for uh, Spain. And so he was tasked with securing colonies and missions at San Diego or Monterey, the areas uh, recommended by Vizcaino and uh, Cabrillo. In setting up the missions, uh, Father Junipero Cerro, who was the president of the missions in Baja at this point, accompanied him so that he could continue and start uh, the mission work and st start uh, establishing uh, missions up in Alta California. In order to colonize uh, California, Portola decided on a two-pronged attack. He was going to send some ships up to San Diego, and he commissioned three ships. One of them sank, two arrived in San Diego, and he also arranged for two land parties to march from uh, Velicata in Baja. It's about a mi 200 miles from uh, San Diego. And this was the first land entry to Alta California. So Portola and Serra built the first Presidio, which is a, was a Spanish fort and a mission in uh, San Diego. After that was underway, Portola marched up to Monterey, which uh, was to be the capital of California. Unfortunately, he failed to recognize the site that had been recommended by Cabrillo and Vizcaino. So he came back and he made a second trip. And this time he made it all the way to San Francisco and they discovered San Francisco Bay, another safe harbor for their shipping. <clears throat> and in the following year, 1770, the second mission and Presidio were founded at Monterey. This shows a picture of uh, Gaspar de Potola on the right in his military uniform. Um, and uh, this, this portrait of him is now hanging at the family home in Catal Catalonia. For the, on the left, we have the statue of Father Junipero Cerro which stood outside the California state capitol until recently when it was removed. Another person who was instrumental in uh, um, colonizing California was Juan Bautista de Anza. He was a Mexican. He was born in Mexico, not in Spain. He fought uh, the Apache and explored Arizona. And he established the first overland trail from Mexico to North Car uh, California. He, uh, like uh, Portola, there were uh, two expeditions in 1771. There was an exploratory expedition from Tubac up the coast of Monterey. Then the following year, the colonizing expedition um, followed with 300 people and 1,000 cattle and he settled a Presidio and mission in Monterey. That was five years after it was founded uh, by Patola. 
<clears throat> then he proceeded up to San Francisco and located the site for the third Presidio and mission. And in 1771, he was made governor of a province of New Spain uh, called Nuevo Mexico. <clears throat> The, the, the Spanish had a system for colonizing Alta California. They planned to establish presidios, the forts, the missions, uh, who were going to convert the Native uh, uh, Americans to Christianity, and the pueblos, which are really the town that would be settlers by uh, settled by the people uh, coming into California. Four presidios were established. We've talked about three of them. There was a fourth one at Santa Barbara in 1782. The mission's uh, purpose was to convert Native Americans to Christianity and to agriculture. Uh, since much of California is dry, it didn't really lead itself well to agriculture. Um, so they had to show uh, Native Americans how, how to deal with that. Missions typically would consist of a priest, a chapel, some living quarters, workshops, and the crops that were going to be growing and the cattle there. 21 were established under uh, Spanish rule, another one under Mexican rule. In areas where the Native American population was low, assistancias would be established which would have the same buildings and amenities but there would be no resident priests the priests would come from the nearby mission the pueblos were established to supply grain to the presidios which were trying to protect everybody and also to colonize uh, california they were established in fertile valleys for the settlers one in San Jose, Los Angeles, Branza Fort, and Sonoma. Branza Fort did not survive, but the other no names are recognizable and live on uh, today. Here is the uh, Presidio at Santa Barbara as it looks today uh, on the left-hand side, and as it would have looked uh, when it was being uh, uh, used back in the 1780s and so on. It uh, was configured as a, a quadrangle surrounded by housing, surrounded by walls for protection. I have mentioned that 21 of these were established under Spanish rule, which went from 1769 to 1821. And the 22nd one was uh, founded in 1823 at Sonoma, under Mexican rule. <clears throat> they are spaced along the El, Cabo, Cal, El Cabino Real, about a day's journey apart. And uh, this was really a continuation of the 27 missions that had been built in Baja starting in 1683. Typically around 5,000 Native Americans would live in or around the missions. <clears throat> The missions, when they came in, confiscated the Native American lands. They promised to return the lands when the Native Americans were converted to Western ways. Um, uh, many of them, because they lost their lands, were forced into agricultural slavery, and most of them never saw their land again. These are the first two California missions to be established, the Basilica de Alcala in San Diego in 1769 and the Mission San Carlos Borromeo in Monterey in 1770. On the right hand side you can see how they're spaced uh, all along the coastline from San Diego up to San Francisco. Now, the mission era came to an end because uh, Mexico, which uh, had its newfound independence from Spain, was very suspicious of the missionaries, many of them who were born in Spain and loyal to Spain, and they were afraid that uh, Spanish influence would get into Mexico through the missionaries. So they passed the 
Secularization Act in 1833, which transferred ownership to the Mexican authority, uh, converted the missions to self-governing towns, and um, the buildings were converted to churches and other civil functions, and the land was to be distributed to the Native Americans. Practice, not all of that happened. The missions and the lands and, uh, and the cattle were sold to the rancho rancheros, the local ranchers, um, about 8 million acres total in lots of 5,000 to 50,000 acres. Few Native Americans received their any land at the end of this period. Um, and while this uh, act ended the mission year, records uh, were kept up until about 1850. As one more part of this act, any uh, missionary who was born in Spain was banished from the country. We talked about the pueblos or the towns, um, the four of them being established um, and uh, one of them branched to fort, uh, not uh, really surviving. They were allocated at about 23,000 acres and they would typically consist of houses, farms, rental lands, commons and pastures. The early settlers who were encouraged to go there received generous pay and food in the beginning. And when the United States uh, took over rule of California, um, they didn't need the presidios as such, so they converted them to pueblos. And you can see there the years in which the various uh, pueblos were established under US rule. Um, Santa Barbara in 1872, all the way to Monterey in 1891. This shows a picture of uh, the Pueblo at Sonoma. It's just before the start of the American-Mexican uh, War. And it shows troops being reviewed by General Man Mariano Guadalupe Viejo. He was the commander general of Alta California, and he turned out to be instrumental in helping Alta California transition to U.S. rule because he felt that California was going to do better under U.S. rule than it would do under Mexican rule. An iconic feature of uh, California and Mexico was the Spanish land grants, and the, Spain had a feudal land-owning system, as did uh, much of Europe, in that the Spanish crown owned the land, and they would give rights to use the land uh, to uh, their, their, their nobles and uh, other, other people they wished to grant land to. Um, so they had settlement and grazing rights. However, with the Spanish land grants, when the landowner died, the land reverted back to the crown. Typically under Spanish uh, rule, grants were given to retired uh, soldiers to encourage them to settle. And 30 were issued uh, uh, up until 1821. The processing for, for process for issuing those land grants were that the commanders of the pueblos and the presidios uh, were authorized to issue land grants within their jurisdiction, and the governor would issue land grants outside the, the jurisdiction. Under Mexican rule, uh, the land grants were a little different. You had to be Mexican born. Mexico was very fearful of any Spanish uh, influence uh, or a naturalized citizen, but the ownership of the land was uh, permanent. The um, land grants were typically about 9,000 acres and uh, 270,000 versus 30 for the uh, Spanish, those granted in Spanish rule. Um, so they issued a lot more land grants in a period of about 13 years than the Spanish did. 
and those uh, land grants still the boundaries of them can be found on modern maps. <clears throat> now, when the Mexican-American War ended uh, at the tr Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, one of the conditions was that the land grants would be honored, and they were honored, except the rancheros had to prove uh, that they owned the title to the Board of uh, California Land Commissioners. And to do that, they used the Mexican land grant records, uh, decenios, which are sketches of the uh, land, and expedientes, which are the uh, uh, paperwork that goes uh, with it. And those were located in uh, Monterey. A total of uh, 813 claims were submitted, 604 of them, so most of them were approved. And as you can imagine, it was a complicated and expensive legal process. And uh, some of the rancheros had to sell portions of the land to pay the legal cost. This shows a couple of examples of the decenios. Um, this is from the California State Archives decenios collection. They are literally hand sketches of the land grants. They use... Uh, natural features for boundaries. Sometimes those natural features uh, went away. So it just gives you a rough idea of the properties that uh, um, what was in, uh, entailed there and the, the boundaries were not that well defined. The land grant on the left is from Sonoma, Francesco Berriessa uh, was the owner and it was granted to him by governor Pio Pico. The one on the right was from San Diego. Pedro C. Carrillo was the owner, and again, granted by Governor Pico Pico. And there are about 149 of these that uh, the California State Archives has. Now, Drake, in 1861, compiled a list of the Spanish land grants. Um, which were granted, in some cases not granted, between 1830 and 1846. And here is uh, that index you see here. There's a number for each. There's a date for each. There's the name of the land grants, uh, whether the uh, land uh, was uh, granted or not, and who owned it. And with that number, you can go into the title registry and you can see who owned uh, that particular portion of land. In this case, this is number 211. And it shows uh, who owned the land when it was granted in 1844, February the 29th. And it says they were given title to the land named Canada. Well, Canada is in uh, Los, An the Los Angeles area. Drake also uh, compiles um, a list of U.S. approved claims. Well, when the U.S. Uh, took over California and uh, re-approved uh, uh, the land claims, um, you can get a list of that. And this gives the, the name, the, the, the name of the owner, the name of the land grant the date, the original date, and whether it was approved by the U.S. or not. Now, we've talked about Mexican independence, um, um, but this will tell you briefly how it happened. Uh, as, as you can Amer imagine, uh, being American, the, the Mexicans wanted to throw off their colonial yoke, in this case, the Spanish yoke in America. We did the same thing with the British yoke. Um, and a priest, Miguel Hidalgo, led the call in 1810 for revolution. And he picked a time when the Spanish control over Mexico was weak. Because he led uh, the call for revolution, he's heralded as the father of the Mexican independence. Unfortunately, he was killed in 1811, the next year. 
Now, what was going on in Spain was really the War of 1812. Napoleon Bonaparte had invaded Spain, and so the Spanish government was preoccupied with dealing with the problem that they had at home. As time went on, um, a liberal uh, government came to power in 1820 in, in Spain, and they promised some reforms to appease Mexico, but many in Mexico really wanted independence, in particular the conservative royalists, because they were afraid they would, uh, with a liberal bias, they might uh, lose their title positions and lands. So they got behind Augustin de Itabida and helped him form an army which fought the Spanish army. And that is how uh, Mexico won their independence from Spain. The following year, he was elected the first emperor of Mexico. Uh, however, it wasn't for another four more years that the first Mexican of governor of Alta California, Jose Enchiandia, was appointed. Now to the Mexican-American War. The original government in Mexico was um, uh, fairly liberal. Their constitution was fairly liberal. But by 1836, a conservative government swept into power. And uh, they abolished the constitution. They dissolved state legislature and disarmed the state militia. When Texas saw that, Texas, of course, was um, ruled by Mexico at that time. They declared their independence as a sovereign nation. Santa Ana, who was the eighth president of uh, Mexico, responded, took an army to Texas and defeated them at the Alamo, which uh, we know uh, very well, the defeat there. Um, however, a little bit later, Santa Ana was uh, captured by the Texans, and in exchange for his life, he ordered the retreat of the Mexican army. And the Mexican army retreated, and Texas uh, claimed that they owned the land down to the Rio Grande. Mexico never acknowledged that, but Mexico was also concerned that the U.S. would annex Texas, which it did in 1845. This was all part of the uh, Manifest Destiny philosophy where America felt that it needed to own North America from the East Coast to the West Coast. So after the U.S. had annexed Texas, uh, Mexico the following year attacked the U.S. Army uh, at Fort Texas on the Rio Grande, and the U.S use that as a pretext to declare war on Mexico. And settlers in Alta California were watching this development uh, carefully. So after war was declared, John Fremont instigated a rebellion called the Ver Flag Rebellion in Sonoma, where briefly Sonoma declared itself as a is a republic in the defiance of uh, Mexico. With all this uh, going on, the U.S. had deployed naval ships off Monterey, which was the capital of uh, California, and they moved in and they captured the capital. And Robert Stockton, who was en route by ship, seized the control of the U.S. forces and then he asked John Fremont to march on Los Angeles to rout the Mexican from their stronghold in Los Angeles. However, before he got there, the Mexican army decided it wasn't going to fight, so it, they retreated to Mexico. So the only remaining resistance was the local settlers, Los Californios. The U.S. Army beat uh, one of the California's armies at San Pascual and captured San Diego. And then following that, they did a similar thing at Los Angeles. And fighting between um, 
the Californios and uh, the U.S. was halted at the Treaty of Coenga in January of 1847, and that effectively ended the conflict in Alta California. In this slide, you can see in the top right-hand side a uh, picture of uh, the Monterey Bay with the American flag being raised on the formerly uh, Mexican capital. And you can see the ships out in the bay there. On the left is the Adobe House where the Treaty of Coenga was signed in 1847. A lot was happening outside uh, uh, Mexico too. Uh, the U.S occupied Santa Fe. Then they blockaded uh, Baja, California. Major General Scott invaded Mexico, uh, captured Mexico City in 1847, and Mexico surrendered, and the agreement was signed at the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and that ended the war. <clears throat> This map shows the territories uh, given up by Mexico and gained by the United States and reflect the current boundaries. Uh, you can see California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, a little piece of Kansas, some of Colorado, and some of Wyoming were, were gained after the um, Mexican-American War. <clears throat> when the war ended, California was governed by the military, and so the inhabitants were very anxious to establish a, a civilian government. So they called a uh, constitutional convention in Monterey, the former capital, in September of 1849. And they outlined and established the civil government. There were 48 signers. Peter Burnett became the first governor. 16, uh, the Senate was to have 16 people, the assembly 36 people. And they rushed their application for statehood uh, through, th thanks in part to all the uh, people who had come to the state um, to look for gold. They had the numbers. And so on September the 9th, 1850, California was admitted as the 31st state as the, of the United States. If you wish to understand what went on at that convention, uh, there's uh, Senator Herbert Jones made an address to the California History Society on the 100 year anniversary in 1949 in San Jose, uh, California. And he'll give you the details of what went on in that first meeting. <clears throat> if you're <clears throat> interested in finding out who signed the California Constitution, <clears throat> at the, excuse me, at the California Genealogical Society. They have the profiles of the signers of the 1849 uh, Constitution. They have biographies there and a uh, record of their signatures. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when gold was found in California, the word literally went all around the world. On January the 24th, 1848, James Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill. The initial impact was that everybody, almost everybody who was in the area left what they were doing and went to the gold fields to try and get rich looking for gold. About 4,000 French San Francisco's and lo local uh, rancheros went off uh, to try and make their fortune. A little bit later, tens of thousands of 49ers left the East Coast by ship, um, going either via Panama. So they'd take the ship to Panama, they'd travel across the Isthmus and wait for a ship to take them up to San Francisco, or they would go around the Cape, uh, both of which were expensive and long journeys. 
About 30,000 came overland by wagon train. These were often families, people who didn't have enough money for um, ships, uh, the ship voyage, or um, had furniture they wanted to bring with them. A few thousand came through Mexico and Arizona, but many came from all over Europe, the United States, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, which was the Sandwich Islands at the time, and China. Now, for some reason, earthquakes seemed to happen in the morning, and the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 was no exception. At 5.12 a.m. on April the 18th, it struck, and it was the deadliest, not the largest, but the deadliest earthquake in U.S. history. Registered 7.8 on the Richter scale. 3,000 people, it's estimated, died. 80% of San Francisco was destroyed. It was characterized by a very large horizontal displacement in the tectonic plates, and it ruptured three hundred miles of the San Andreas Fault from Mendocino at the top of the red line um, on the right there to San Juan Bautista, which is about um, two thirds of the way down. It ignited many widespread fires, particularly in, the, in San Francisco, and its effects could be felt from Oregon to Los Angeles. To give you an idea of the devastation, the picture on the left shows the area around Post and Grant Avenues in San Francisco, and you can see the buildings that have crumbled there. This was taken uh, right after um, the earthquake. You can see what happened to the San Francisco City Hall there, pretty much demolished, except the two two towers. I'm not quite sure why they they uh, uh, stood up, but uh, you might think they would be the first things to go down. Then uh, uh, here on Sacramento Street, you can see the fire bill fires billowing in the background there. And five days after the quake, um, this aerial photograph was taken showing the devastation that occurred uh, widespread uh, to San Francisco. <clears throat> Now, let's talk a little bit about um, the records. The top three are U.S. records, uh, 1850 federal census. So anybody, as far as our program goes, anybody who's mentioned in that 1850 federal census um, is an eligible pioneer. California ha held its state census in 1852. Uh, and there was also a federal one in 1860. So people who are in the historic gold rush counties in those two censuses uh, are eligible pioneers as well. Below that are the colonial records. The list is me Mexican, but some are really Mexican, some are Spanish. And you can see there from San Francisco, Los Angeles and Orange counties, California, two Presidios, Monterey and San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Jose, and California. And the missions often held uh, censuses too. Two of them uh, here are one from the San Luis Rey uh, mission, the other one from San Luis Obispo. <clears throat> this 1836 uh, cens uh, Mexican census of Los Angeles and Orange counties, um, is interesting in that it shows some of the things you have to do when you're trying to set up a, a website with the kind of resources that we are. <clears throat> the Family Search uh, Library had this on microfilm. And so I had to go to the Family Search Library and digitize it and bring the digital record back home. But it was copyrighted. Uh, this is obviously a transcript. The transcript was made on the 100th anniversary of uh, when this census was taken in 1936, and it was taken by Santa Ana College, so I had to communicate with them and get their permission to put it on our website. There are two portions to it. One uh, is the order in which the names are recorded in the census, 
And the other part is an alphabetized list. And we have the alphabetized list on our website. This is, shows the Spanish uh, mission census from San Carlos between 1796 and 1798. It gives very little information, uh, in some case, just a single name. Uh, so we got the name and the age. There's also a uh, Los Angeles prefecture record covering the period 1829 to 1850, which gives an account of the official business of the prefecture. But they also have an index of inhabitants. And you can see the top part of the index here. Um, and the location that you where you can find their their record, but they've also marked uh, whether the names were indicated in the 1836, the 1850 census, or the Bancroft Pioneer Register. Hubert Howe uh, Bancroft compiled uh, a uh, register of uh, pioneers from 1542 to 1848. And this is a tremendous resource. This snippet is uh, shows Mariano Guadalupe Viejo I talked about before, and it gives you the genealogy of uh, his family. For the California missions, uh, the registers are held by the Huntington Library but they transcribed them under their early California population project. And they created a very comprehensive transcript of the information in the registers. They include Native American soldiers and settlers of uh, Alta California. <clears throat> they cover 21 missions, Santa Barbara Presidio and the Los Angeles Plaza Church. There are about 200,000 in all. Um, over 100,000 baptisms, 27,000 mar marriages, and 71,000 burials, uh, covering the periods 1769 to 1850. And this shows their search page when you go to their website, and you can see you can search on an awful lot of uh, criteria. Ego there, by the way, is the principal. This is a baptismal search, um, and you can uh, search on the, many of the, the characteristics of the principal from his Spanish name to his native name to his surname and also um, on the father and the mother's data. Now a good way to use that is to search for the person that you're looking for and then there are um, original mission records that are available um, so that you can take a look at the original record for your ancestor. Unfortunately, some of these uh, you need to go to the Family Search Center for. And as a final slide, I have some useful links for you, but there are many more on, uh, on our website. This is our, our website. So let me get over there on my other screen here. San Diego Genealogical website. If you click on that California Certificate Program, this shows, I'm going to go quickly through that. The honor wall that we have, we have the entry portals there, and we have some biographies on the left and some additional resources on the right-hand side. And there's another page that we have where you can get some additional resources. Now, we're going to go first through the biography portal and then to the residence portal. And I set these up just to make it easier. If you click on the pioneer portal, it brings you to this finding aid. And we're going to pick the first one, the history of Yolo County. This is a book by Tom Gregory written in 1913. We're going to click on Yolo here and it will bring you to um, this transcribed spreadsheet which where we have gone through all the names in these biographies and picked out the ones who are the vetted California pioneers and we've included as much pertinent information as we can. We have the name here, 
Um, this is where you click to get to the record. This is the page. And we indicate whether they're a pioneer, a gold uh, residence pioneer, gold rush pioneer, or in some cases, both. We've got the sex, um, the vital events, where they were born, if we have it, where they were living in California. And in some cases, there's more than one address because many people came to the gold rush for a short period of time and then left and went into farming. So if I click on this YOLO here, it brings me to that page. There's an initial page I didn't show you. You do a control find up here to get the Honorable H. Freeman, and there is his biography. For the California residents, 1950, uh, we've indicated which of the historic gold rush counties here in gold. You can click on any one of those to get to the county you're interested in. We're going to go look for Hope Mint in Butte and click on that one. And that takes you immediately to the Family Search original record there. And uh, we made a decision on the website um, not to include large files, but rather to link to them. Okay, with that, I will stop the share. Sorry if I'm running over a little bit. No, it's okay. So we do have a couple of questions in here. I'm going to preface the Q&A part by saying that if we don't get to all of your questions uh, or if you'd like to copy of the chat, send us an email. Um, the contact page on the California San Diego Geological Society's website, I'm going to put a link to that okay. in the chat. So. Okay. Um, somebody was asking, as far as qualifying for the certificate program, do you need to be a direct descendant or could great grand uncles count? No, it has to be direct descendant. Okay. Uh, somebody else was asking, did people have to register when they landed in El Dorado in 1852? They said that their great grand uncles did with their wives. One of the wives wrote on her wrote of her trek across the prairie, so she wrote about it. Um, but did they have to register when they landed? Um, I'm not not sure that under under Mexican rule you did, mm -hmm. but I'm not not sure whether in the very early days of California that you had to register. It's it's possible. All right. Well. Seeing any other questions in here? They were all so quiet during your presentation. They, I think, they were all just sitting back and just enjoying your presentation. Okay. And you know, thank you, Colin, for okay. such a great program. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah, it was very rich, full of you know that wonderful historical context that we all love. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'd never think of uh, California. It's so different than the, the perhaps the way it is today, and it's uh, I. I don't, I don't have anybody, as we were talking about uh, before, I don't have anybody in California, but I've been so interested learning about it uh, and yeah. the, the, the habits, what went on, uh, what it took to uh, gain independence and become part of the United States. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you again, Colin, and thank all of you for, for joining us. Uh, as I said, if you would like a copy of the chat, please send us an email. It is genealogy at acpl.info, which I will put in the chat again. And if you have more questions about the certificate program, um, do contact the San Diego, San Diego Geological yeah, Society. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be happy to help you with any questions you have. Right. And if you're worried about getting the paperwork together, or I mentioned this, we do help people um, if they're having trouble finding some records. Great. Well, all right. So we're just about out of time. So I hope all of you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. And you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.